Luke 11. If you'll go with me to Luke chapter 11, we're going to finish up our Secret Life series, talking about building a secret life with God, a life just founded in prayer. Next week, we're going to be kicking off a fall series. I'm excited about this. Um, it's going to be a longer series. It's going to be about seven weeks. Um, you will hear from me one more time. Next week, I'm going to kick off that series, and then you're going to get to hear from our pastoral team. You're going to get to hear several of them bring the word, which I'm excited about. And, um, and I'm not going to tell you exactly what it's about yet, but uh, it's going to be good. I think we're going to have a good time. Um, so Luke chapter 11. I want to walk with you through the first 13 verses this morning, um, but I just want to read verse 1 to you right now. Let's, uh, let's just, uh, you can follow along as I read this. It says, verse 1, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. Everybody say certain. certain. One Jesus pr was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And I mentioned uh, in the, the first week that this is the only time we see in Scripture that the disciples actually ask Jesus to teach them something. And you and I need to be thankful that they did. Because when they asked the question, will you teach us to pray, Jesus did teach them immediately. And we have it all right here in Luke chapter 11. We have the most powerful and practical seminar on prayer from Jesus himself. So that 2,000 years later, you can read Luke chapter 11, and you can learn how to pray like Jesus. So this morning, as we wrap up this series, I'm calling this message, Pray Like Jesus. Pray Like Jesus. Will you pray with me one more time? Holy Spirit, as we go into the Word, we open our hearts we open our ears, we open our minds, we pray, God, that our hearts would be rich soil before you. We pray, Jesus, that you would speak directly to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, look at somebody and say, pray like Jesus. Pray like Jesus. I want to pray like Jesus. I want to pray like Jesus. I want to see the miracles Jesus saw. I want to do the works Jesus did. I don't want to be surprised when God answers prayer. You ever had that where like God answers a prayer and you're actually surprised? And then you remember like you're a Christian, you're not supposed to be surprised? Like that's supposed to happen? Like I don't want to be surprised when God answers prayer. I told this story earlier this year. I'm going to tell it again because I think it's just so funny to me. That there was a tiny town out west of the Midwest where this uh, nightclub came into the city and began to operate, and so one night, this uh, little local church in the tiny town, they all gathered for an all-night prayer service in order uh, to ask God to shut down that den of iniquity, you know, the nightclub, and lo and behold, I, I don't know that it was on that night, but at some point, lightning struck the nightclub, and I assume burnt it to the ground, because the nightclub owner found out about the prayer meeting, and he sued the church. So they've come to court, and, and, of course, the church denies responsibility. They say they didn't do it, right? And so the judge ended up having to throw the court case out, and his final words on the case were, you know, it's the most amazing thing. Uh, he says the, the nightclub owner evidently believes in prayer more than the church does. <laughs> because he's convinced their prayers did this, and they say they had nothing to do with it. I don't want to be surprised when God answers prayer. I don't want to be surprised. So the disciples come to him in Luke 11, and they ask him, Lord, will you teach us to pray? Now, if we're, if we're being honest and looking at the Gospels as a whole, there are many times throughout the Gospels that people ask Jesus to do things. And if you've read the Gospels, you know that he is notorious for refusing to do any of it. You ever notice this? Jesus just doesn't like to do whatever people want him to do, often throughout the Gospels. The devil obviously asked him to do many things in the wilderness. He refuses all of them. The Pharisees come to him at one point, and they say, well, tell us by what authority you're doing these things. And he's like, well, you answer my question, and then I'll tell you. And they don't, so he doesn't, you know. In John 6, a crowd of people who Jesus loves and ministers to, a whole crowd of people, probably thousands, come to him, and they ask him, 
give us a sign so that we may believe in you. And Jesus says, no. Like he's notorious for not doing whatever people want him to do. Even his mother had to ask him twice in order to get him to turn the water into wine. Mom had to ask twice. Because the first time he said, no. Here's what I've learned about Jesus. It seems like to me in the Gospels, the only requests Jesus takes are prayer requests. Anything outside of that, he's just not really doing. And so when the disciples come to him in Luke chapter 11 and they say, Jesus, will you teach us to pray? He immediately begins to teach them. Why? Why is it that in this case, Jesus does exactly what they want him to do? It's because he wants his people to pray. He wants his people to pray. And so they begin to learn, and we begin to learn directly from Jesus how we pray. So I want to give you a few things that I think are going to help us this morning as we end this series. If we're going to pray like Jesus, here's what Jesus teaches us in Luke chapter 11. Number one, pray habitually. If you're going to pray like Jesus, you must pray habitually. You must make a habit out of of prayer. Look at what it says again in verse 1. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. Come on, everybody say certain. He was praying in a certain place. I love that line. He was praying in a certain place. Have you learned the power of certainty? There's a lot of power in certainty. Not only had Jesus set aside, set aside a certain time and a certain place to pray, but he was also praying from a place of certainty. You know what I mean by that? I mean, he was certain that heaven was going to hear his cry. He was certain that heaven was going to respond to his cry. He was praying from a place of certainty. Have you learned to pray in a certain place? Certain means to not doubt. It means to be determined. It means to be resolved. It, and so let me just say this. The first step to being certain about what you pray is to be certain that you pray. Okay. Let me say that again. The first step to being certain about what you pray is being certain that you pray. You cannot be certain that what you have prayed heaven's going to respond to you and God's going to answer and God's going to heal if you're not certain that you're going to get in the closet and actually pray. Like you've got to be certain that you will pray daily, that this is a normal part of your life. This is why Jesus said, when you pray, go into your room. He didn't say if. This is a certain thing. When you pray, you've got to be certain that prayer is going to be a normal part of your life. Have you learned to make it a habit? Listen, I know that our days look different every day. And I know that you, you and I, we can't possibly know what's going to happen from day to day. And our schedules change and our routines change and things come up and things happen. But there are certain things that you make sure you do every day. Am I right? You make sure you get out of bed every day. You make sure you put some clothes on your body every day. You may, I hope you make sure you brush your teeth every day, right? Twice a day, right? There are certain things. You're going to make sure you sit down and eat a meal at least once a day, if not three times. There are certain things that you are certain about in your day-to-day -day life. There are certain things that you make sure happen. So how do we make prayer one of those things? Like how do we, and I'm not, I know like the spiritual, like, well, I'm praying all day, and I'm walking with God all day and me and the Lord talk all the time okay listen Jesus was praying in a certain place at a certain time when there was nothing else happening but his connection to the Father if he needed that we need that right and so there's got to be a way for us to take prayer out of the category of optional out of the category of it may happen if I have enough time if I find enough if I find enough uh, uh, relaxation in my schedule. Like, how do we get it out of that category and into the category of eating, sleeping, dressing, brushing? Like, how do we make it something that is certain in our day? If you're going to pray like Jesus, you have to pray habitually. You have to 
pray as a habit. Jesus prayed as a habit. What is a habit? A habit is an action or a practice that is performed so regularly that it becomes automatic. It just becomes natural. You don't even think about it when you're doing it. These are the things that we do which we don't have to think about. I like to say it like this. Habits are small changes in our day that create big differences in our lives. Okay? Small changes in our day that make big differences in our lives. And, and here's, the, here's the reality. You know this. Our lives are full of good ones and bad ones. And it's so easy to develop a bad habit, and it's so hard sometimes to develop a good habit. Everybody, everybody say amen. Right. And so here's the, here's the beautiful thing, though. Here's the good news is that you have the ability to set healthy habits and to destroy bad ones. And so spending time with the Father, spending minutes in the Word every day, spending minutes in prayer every day equates to a big difference in your life. Now, I hear people, when we talk like this, I hear people say, well, like, well I just, I don't want it to be a chore, you know? I don't want being with God to be a chore. Okay. But your chores get done, right? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, that, like chores, there are some chores we hate to do, but we do them because we hate even more when they're not done. And so it's like you, your chores are those things which you know you have to do in order for your life to stay in order. Are you hearing me? <laughs> It's like, it's like you, you might hate, hate to do the laundry, but you'll hate it even more when you go to the closet and have nothing to wear because <laughs> it's all in a pile in the corner of your room. You, you, it's like you, you may hate to do the dishes, but you'll hate it even more when like it's, re- it's time to eat and you have to like eat out of the pot on the stove. You know what I'm saying? It's like at a certain point you realize I may, this may not be pleasant always for me to do, but if I don't have it, my life gets out of order. That's prayer. Are you hearing me? I, I'm okay I would rather prayer become a chore in my life than be absent from my life. And I get, I understand why people say this because like, well, we want to engage our hearts though. I don't want to just do it out of the motions. I don't want it to be a religious thing. And I applaud that. I agree with you. But I would rather do the hard work of, of daily trying to and working to engage my heart in, in my actions than just ignoring the action. <laughs> avoiding the action like this has to become a daily habit in our lives where we're sitting at the feet of Jesus because when we don't life gets out of order like prayer is putting your heart in order the same way that your chores are putting your house in order like you've got you you have to understand that the necessity of this it goes under the radar sometimes because we think we're doing okay without it or we think that we don't really need it that much. And I'm telling you, the house gets out of order. Your heart gets out of order when you're not sitting with the Father every day. Prayer cleans the house. In 2001, these researchers, uh, they did a study in which they were trying to figure out how to help people develop healthy exercise habits. And so they took about 248 people. They split them into three groups. And the first group was the control group. And and so the first group, all they asked them to do is simply record how often you exercise throughout the week. That's it. Just record how often you exercise. Group number two, they were asked to do the same thing. Record how often you exercise throughout the week. And they educated them on heart disease and how exercise helps to prevent heart disease and the benefits of exercise and why this is important in your life and why you need this. Right? That was group two. But then group three, they asked them to do the same thing as group one and two. Record how much often you exercise. Here's the education. Here's all the content. Like, here's why you need exercise. Here's why it's important. Here's what's going to matter in your life. But group three was also asked, at the beginning of each week, we want you to fill out this sentence. Okay? And the sentence was, during this week, I will partake in at least 20 minutes of vigorous exercise on blank day, at blank time, at blank place. Fill out that sentence, right? Okay, they, they, they finish the research, they get back the results, they found out that between the first two groups, 35 to 38% of the people exercised at least once a week, okay? Once a week. 
Here's what's amazing, though. There was no difference between group one and group two. So even though group two had the education of why this is important, it did not motivate them any more than group one to actually do it. What am I saying? Knowing that we should doesn't make us do it. It doesn't. I mean, we can do all the education, and maybe sometimes you'll see something that really wakes you up, but the majority of the time, knowing that you should is really still not going to be a motivator for doing it. So then they, looked, they got the results back from group three, and 91% of the people in group three exercised at least once a week. It was double the normal rate. What made the difference? Well, the first two groups were trying to add a discipline in their life, and the third group was forced to develop a habit. The difference was certainty. By making them fill out this sentence at the beginning of the week, they had to come up with a certain time, a certain place that they were going to do a certain thing. And as a result, nine out of 10 people, it sounds like a dentist commercial, right? Nine out of 10 people actually did the thing. Why? Because at the beginning of the week, they had to be certain. Come on, have you learned the power of certainty? Okay, I got a homework assignment for you. He's like, I know this dude. Yeah, I'm actually doing it. Like, I, here's my homework assignment for you, okay? And I'm your pastor now, so you have to do it. <laughs> Tonight, before you lay your head on the pillow, I want you to somewhere in your house write this big and put it on display do it with your spouse do it with your kids do it as a family i want you to fill out this sentence tonight before you start this week this week i will partake in 20 minutes of intense heartfelt prayer each day at blank time at blank place oh see some of y'all are groaning you're like you just went back to fourth grade you're like this is the power of certainty. If this is not important enough for us to make a part of our daily lives, I don't know why it's important enough for co to come here every Sunday and listen to us preach the Bible. It, honestly, it's a waste of time to open this up if we don't actually believe that this part of our day is the most important thing, right? I'm going to participate in 20 minutes of intense, heartfelt prayer each day at blank time and blank place. That may look different for you. You may do it differently than others. But this is about being certain. This is about making prayer a habit in your life. Someone say amen. Amen. Like we have to determine to be more certain about prayer than our next meal, than what we'll wear tomorrow, than what we'll do tomorrow. Prayer has to be on the list of those things which are certain. I mentioned Last week, my mom, you know, my mom is a, she's a prayer warrior. She, she prays like it's her job. Um, I believe she, she puts more uh, intentionality into prayer than, you know, the average person for sure. And, uh, and I, I grew up in a house where she demonstrated that, but I didn't appreciate it. I didn't know what I had. And so growing up, it was pretty common for my mom. She would come in the living room about 7 or 8 o'clock at night, which, by the way, is prime television watching time. They call it prime time for a reason. And this is back when we only had cable, so you had to watch it when it was coming on. And she would come in the living room and she would say, okay, it's, it's my time to pray, so you can either join me or you can get out, you know? And I'm like, there are, there are at least seven rooms in this house that you could pray, you know? Like, in a, in a, in a very small house, there's at least Many other options other than the middle one in which the TV sits. <laughs> like, do you have to pray here? Yeah, I never said that, you know. I never said that. And I didn't know the Bible enough to, like, quote it to her and say, the Lord says go to your room. When you pray, go to your room. Go to your room, you know. I didn't know it enough. Uh, so I would, I would leave and, like, go somewhere, you know, else to watch TV. Do you know how hard it is to watch TV when someone is a few rooms over just pouring their heart out to God and praying over you? Do you know how hard that is to just, like, you can't do it. It's convicting. It's hard. And I, I remember, like, that, that was normal in our house. Like, it was just, that was normal. And, and, and now, as I'm older, I realize how much I appreciate that I had a mom who said, every night, I'm going to pray at the center of our house. 
I'm going to pray and I'm going to demonstrate to my kids and my family like this is important. This, this precedes everything. This pushes everything to the side. I'm going to pray here. I'm going to pray out loud. I'm going to cry out to God. I'm going to ask God to come and intervene in our family. I'm going to ask him to come and intervene in all of these needs. I'm going to demonstrate that prayer is a certain thing. It's a certain thing. And it has to be that in our lives. Listen, this is how we pray like Jesus. You want to pray like Jesus? Pray habitually. Number two, you want to pray like Jesus? Pray strategically. Come on, everybody say strategically. Strategically. You want to pray like Jesus? You got to pray strategically. Look at verse two. He said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Now, here Luke gives us a shorter version of what we have coined the Lord's Prayer. That's why it may sound a little different. Maybe it sounds like it's leaving things off. The longer version is in the book of Matthew. Luke gives us a shorter version here. This is such a powerful blueprint of prayer, and honestly, we could do an entire series just on the Lord's Prayer. But I want you to hear the strategy behind every single line that Jesus is praying. Because when he, what he tells them in Luke 11 is he says, when you pray, pray this. He doesn't even say, in some translations, he doesn't even say pray like this. He says pray this. Actually pray these words. I want you to hear the strategy behind each line. First, our Father. Recognition. We talked about this last week recognizing who God is. If you don't know who he is, you don't know what he can do. So first, our Father, recognizing who he is. Next, hallowed be your name, or holy is your name. Uh, it's praise and adoration. We call this worship. It's worshiping the Father. It's blessing him with our worship and our praise. It's adoring him. It's preparing our hearts to come before him because we're recognizing who he is. Another translation of this, hallowed be thy name, is your name should be kept holy. Now, I really want to get on my soapbox for just a minute and talk about why his name should be kept holy. I'm not, because it deserves a lot of attention. But let me just say this. You can't keep his name holy if you use his name constantly in every way in every scenario. If Jesus Christ is in the realm of cuss words in your life, you're profaning the name of God. I don't like just saying his name if I don't mean for him to come. You hear me? And it's important for us that, like the Hebrews, had a, this was in their culture that they protected his name. They wouldn't even write his name on paper. They wouldn't keep scrolls in their houses if the scrolls had God's name on it. They had to only keep it in the temple because how dare the holy name of God come into a common place such as my home. I'm not saying we return to religion. I'm not saying that we, that we come back to a law. I'm saying that we come back to the place that his name actually means something. It has to mean something. You don't use your mom's name as a cuss word, and you wouldn't let somebody else use it. Why? Because mom means something to you. But God's name means nothing? Oh, we're quiet. <laughs> I, all, all I'm going to say is if his name means nothing to you on your good days and in your common conversation, why should his name mean anything to your pain and your sorrow when you use it in prayer? Okay? Okay. Like, if his name lacks power in your daily life, it will lack power in your prayer life. I can promise you that. If his name means nothing to you in your daily life, it will mean nothing in your prayer life. If it was important enough for God to make this one of his ten commandments, if it was important enough for Jesus to include this in his prayer, it should be important enough for us to obey. Amen. All right, number three, your kingdom come. Submission and surrender. Uh, you know, the longer version of Matthew says, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is... Coming to the Lord, before we bring our needs to him, we bring ourselves to him. Your kingdom come. I'm laying down my kingdom, and I'm asking for your kingdom. Your will be done. I'm laying down my will. I'm asking for your will. This is about submission to God's leadership as we pray. All right, give us this day our daily bread. This is what we call supplication. 
or provision. We're asking God to supply our needs. This is the asking portion of prayer. Here's what I need, God. Here's what I'm asking you to do, right? Forgive us our sins. Confession and repentance is where we come before the Lord and we say, I've done wrong. I've fallen short. I failed to live up to the standard you've called me to, and I need your grace. Goes on to say, as we also forgive everyone, this is reflection and conviction. Now, God, search my heart and show me if there be any wicked way in me. Who have I not forgiven? You following me? Last thing, and lead us not into temptation. Protection. Now, God, provide a covering for me as I go into out my day. God, cover me, anoint me, take care of me, protect me. Travel mercies, God, right? We do all the things. Hear, hear me. Do you hear the strategy that Jesus was praying? There was strategy. And, and here's what I'm saying. Please hear me. I'm not saying that you need a formula. I'm not saying that there's a right or wrong way to pray. Okay? God hears our cries. However they come, whenever they come, whatever words we use, he hears us. Strategy doesn't help God. Strategy helps you. Do you hear me? Strategy helps us remember what's important in prayer. So it's not like God is waiting for you to get this and, and include these things and why didn't you? It's like, this is not a script, but this is a strategy for making sure we remember those things which are important to God and are important to us. We often come into our prayer times frazzled and we're trying to remember, you know, who we need to pray for and what we need to pray for. And so sometimes praying strategically helps us to uh, have an effective or an edifying prayer time. How else can you pray strategically? Uh, write out your prayers. Have a prayer journal. That helps. That's a great way to, to pray and talk to God and get everything out of your heart. Um, pray out loud. For the love of the Lord, pray out loud. He gave you a voice. Don't you dare use your voice on everything else and then come to him and you're like, inwardly, I'm talking to God. Okay, I, I, we can do that and we should. But it, there are times where it's like, you got to pray out loud. Your thoughts will wander off, but your words will not. So pray. like act, And I know, it's like, well, that's awkward. There's people in my house. And it's like, okay, throw on music. Go in the woods. Whatever you've got to do to talk to the Lord. My prayer life shifted when I finally got for, forgot all of the, the pressures and how am I going to sound and what are people going to think and what am I going to look like. And I just said, I'm going to talk to God like he's here because he is. It's faith in prayer. And another way, pray strategically. Get a prayer list. Write out everything you need to be praying for so that when you come into prayer, you remember those things. Many of you know Barbara Peters. She was a mother of this house for many years. She's Pastor Donna's mother passed away a couple years ago. And just she had... She had a prayer list of hundreds of names that she would go through every single day. And I, I called it a hit list. Because if you were on that, that prayer list, like the Lord was coming for you. <laughs> like God assigned Jason born angels to Barbara's prayers. Like if she prayed for you, like the Lord was coming. It was, it was, in, uh, you know, it was going to happen. And I would just remember, like, she would, she, seeing those lists, those papers are half falling apart, and there's just hundreds. I'm not exaggerating, am I? There's hundreds of names and needs on that list. Why? What was she doing? She's praying strategically. I'm not going to forget any need that's come to me so I can bring it to the Lord. Day after day after day. If you want to pray like Jesus, you got to pray strategically. Pray habitually. Pray strategically. Number three. Pray persistently. Pray persistently. Look at verse 5. Jesus goes on to tell us a parable about prayer. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Amen, said all the parents who were still co-sleeping with small kids. I'm not getting out of this bed. <laughs> I hear you. All right. 
He goes on to say, I tell you, even though you, he would not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity. Come on, say shameless audacity. Oh, I love it. Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, to the one who knocks, the door will be open. If you highlight in your Bible anything, you need to highlight those two words, shameless audacity. The Lord calls his people to pray with shameless audacity. There's this philosophy that's been floating around the church for centuries that attempts to use God's sovereignty as an excuse to neglect prayer. The idea is, well, if it's God's will, it will happen. I don't need to pray it. If it's the Lord's will, he'll make sure it happens. I hate that line of thinking. I don't think it comes from God. I, I believe it's very true that God is sovereign, and there are times where we pray things that are not in the will of the Lord, and he's not going to allow them. But if it's true that only the, the will of God can be done on his own without the prayers of people, why would Jesus command us in his prayer, pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Why would that be a command? Why would we be asked and commanded that we make sure we pray the will of God happen on earth? Listen, it's because God has dominion and authority over the earth, but he also, and he can override that, you know, he can override man's free will, but God also gives dominion and authority to us on the earth. So he, though he can override it, he wants to work through us to bring about his will on the earth. There is a spiritual battle happening around us. You know what spiritual warfare is? Spiritual warfare is the attempt of the enemy, of the demonic. It's the attempt of spirits, the, the real. It's the attempt of the demonic to thwart the will of God on the earth. That's what spiritual warfare is. So, so it, it, is, it is up to the people of God to heed the word of God and engage in spiritual warfare and press back the gates of hell and to pray the things that God has called us to pray for to see the will of God on the earth. So when we don't see the will of God on the earth, it's not because God is not doing his job. It's the people of God not doing our job. We're called to push back darkness with the weapons of our warfare, which is prayer. Do you hear me? It's the prayer of the people of God that bring about the will of God on the earth. I've sat in too many conversations where people are talking about, well, God's sovereignty and man's free will and Calvinism and Arminianism and, and what do we think about predestination? It's like, listen, can we read Jesus' words? <laughs> when the disciples came to him and said, will you teach us to pray? He gave a, a, a seminar in, in 12 verses on prayer. And one-third of that seminar is a parable about how when you pray, you should keep praying and keep praying and don't stop praying and persist in prayer and keep praying and keep praying. Like one-third of his lesson on prayer is don't stop praying. Keep pushing. Shameless audacity. It's shameless audacity. Uh, football fans, you'll appreciate this. I heard uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, you know, the Chicago Bears and the Kansas City Chiefs played, and someone was in the Kansas City airport, and they said this woman got off the plane. No sooner than had she got off the plane, she had assembled her Chiefs, I mean, her, her Chicago Bears flag. She's in all Chicago Bears get up, and she's going down the airport going like, woo, go Bears, go Bears, you know, in the Kansas City airport. Woo! Go Bears! You know? Now, let me fill you in if you don't know anything about football. The Bears are the worst team in the league. They are 0-3. They lost that game 41-10. to And the only, the only touchdown they scored was like a give me at the end of the game. Like, they're the worst team in the league. 
Now, you, what you can appreciate about that woman is that she was a loyal fan, right? Hear me. Some of us have been more loyal to losing teams than a winning God. Like, we will show up every week at the same time in front of the same TV and watch a team lose and struggle to show up in the secret place. I No judgment. <laughs> But do you hear me? Like, it's shameless audacity that says, despite losing, I'm going to keep going forward. Why are we not doing that in prayer? I don't care if I don't see it. He said to keep praying. He said keep knocking. And I'm going to keep knocking till I see it. We would develop a backbone in every other area. We would not dare let somebody talk to our kids in some certain way. We'll develop a backbone out of nowhere and stand up. But when it comes to prayer, we shrink. We say, well, it must not be his will. And we can't find the backbone. The church is in need of a backbone again in the secret place. Like this has to become shameless audacity. It has to be our heartbeat. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep persisting in prayer. Years ago, we had a neighbor walk across the street, and he said, he, he knocked on the door. He said, hey, man, I, my mower broke down. Can I borrow your mower? I'm like, yeah, I'm a good Christian. Take the mower, you know, and, and so he goes in Moses' yard, brings it back the next week. Hey, man, I can't borrow your mower again. Sorry, I just, you know, right, no problem, man. Go, go take it, whatever. Next week. Hey, man. Sorry, I just, I still haven't got a mower yet. Can I borrow? Yeah, man, sure, go ahead. Next week. And I'm, like, it got to about week seven before I'm like, hey, so, so what's going on with the mowers? You know? I mean, we're, we're talking like maybe 10, 12, I don't know. It was a couple months, you know? Hey, man. <laughs> and, and you could see the hesitation more and more every time. And I told Jill, I'm like, and, and it wasn't actually, it, it wasn't a big deal because I'm like, I'm not using it today. You can use it. But I'm like, I guess, I guess this is what it feels like to co-own a mower now. Um, <laughs> we're living communally with the neighbors. Uh, I guess this is the rest of my life now. Um, and, um, but I told you, I was like, you know, it's, it's, I gotta, I gotta respect him. Like, how do you keep coming every single week with your head held high? I mean, at week seven, I'd have gone to another neighbor and started asking, you know, but to come back to the same. <sighs> hey, man, um, listen, that is shameless audacity. It's shameless audacity. He eventually got his own. Um, we didn't have to map out a joint custody of my mower. Um, but I, I'm thinking, how do we develop a rigidness? Listen, in, in this story, this neighbor is standing out front, and it's embarrassing. Maybe it's cold. It's late. Uh, you, you've probably been in some kind of situation where you're like, I, I hate that I'm asking you to do this. I hate that I have to get you out of bed. I hate that you're going to wake your kids up. I don't want to if I had any other options. But he's standing outside of his home, and he's knocking on the door because he has no other option. I am so sorry. <laughs> but can you please? Like, I need something. Please. Like, he's banging on the door. Open up. Open up. <laughs> no, you're going to have to open up. And the whole point of the parable is that even though... Uh, the man won't get up for friendship's sake and just to be a good neighbor, he will eventually get up to stop the knocking. Like, stop the knocking. Okay, I'll get up. And that's the whole point of the parable is like, if, if I'm your father and I want what's good for you, how much more if you just persist and persist and push through and break through. Come on, I've got to do whatever I've got to do. God, I need you to show up. Holy Spirit, I need you to intervene. Every demonic attack has to fall now. Every demon in my house has to flee. Everything that comes and causes sickness, whatever it is, I need you to show I'm going to keep knocking. Do you realize the Hebrew word for prayer actually also translates to plead? The Greek word for prayer translates to beg. Do you hear me? It's like, like, like our prayers at times 
should sound like pleading and begging. It's the desperation of God's people that allows us to press in, push on, and break through. Break through. Jesus spent one-third of his lesson on prayer about being persistent. There was a, a, a British evangelist by the name of George Mueller. Y'all are like, man, you're really on this point. I'm persisting. Do you see? <laughs> George Mueller was a revivalist, British revivalist, and in his adulthood at some point, he began praying for five of his friends to come to know Jesus. After two months of praying, one of them came to know Jesus. It took 10 years for the other two to come to know Jesus. 10 years of praying, okay? And then after 25 years of praying, the fourth one finally gave his life to Jesus. George Mueller died with the fifth man still not having come to Jesus. He prayed for that fifth man for 52 years. And shortly after he died, shortly after his funeral, that fifth man gave his life to Jesus. 52 years. Listen, it, it is time the church got desperate again. Can I tell you this? Here's a, here's a bottom line. I think we put this on the screen. Is what you're desperate for, you're destined for. Whatever you're desperate for, whatever you will get desperate for, you will be destined for. That works good and bad ways. If you're desperate for something, you're going to find a way to get it. Prayer absent of desperation is rarely answered. Not because God doesn't care, because we don't care. If unanswered prayer doesn't bother you, if, if unanswered prayer doesn't move you, you won't be moved by answered prayer. And this is why God will answer prayers and we give him no glory, we have no thanks, because it really didn't matter to us anyways. Like prayer absent of desperation rarely happens. If you're unmoved by unanswered prayers, you won't be moved by answered ones. The church is in need of shameless audacity again. And I know the struggle. Like, I know, I know the tension in this and what I'm saying because it's like, well, how do we know if it's even the Lord's will? And what if I'm praying for this thing and God's, the answer is no? Right? How do I know? Right? Here's my philosophy. Uh, it's a Tim Beck philosophy. Those of you who know Tim Beck, he taught me this years ago. It's I go until I hear a no. <laughs> I'm going, and if the Lord doesn't want me to pray about this anymore, he will have to tell me, and he will. <laughs> Right? Because prayer is engaging with the heart of God. The Lord will reveal to your heart in prayer if he's telling you to let go of something. I believe that. But, but oftentimes I believe that we fail to press in, push through, break through in prayer because we just assume we know the will of God because it's not happening. We'll pray for something for a few days. We'll pray for a week or two, and we don't see it happening, and then we just assume that God's not doing it. And I believe it's because we're lacking desperation, and we need it again in the church. I, I, have, been, I have been in the tension of why isn't God answering. Listen, I don't know why God doesn't heal all the time. I can't answer that for you. I don't like to make blanket statements. Well, it's always because, or God always. Like, I, don't, I don't like to do that. Right? I have been, I've walked with kids through cancer. I have walked, I've led prayer meetings where we ask God to save the life of innocent children from horrific diseases, and it didn't happen. I've walked with kids to their death on a deathbed. I've, I've been in that place where we're asking God to move and we're asking God to heal and we're fasting and we're praying and we're showing up every day and we're doing it and we're doing it. And here's where I've landed. If God doesn't heal them, it won't be because I didn't ask. That, that, there's my theology. It's like, well, how do you, it's like, no, no, no listen, this is, this is where I land. If God doesn't heal, I won't let it be because I didn't ask or I didn't believe for it. And so when he doesn't heal, I'm still going to believe that God is God, that God is good. And I, the next time this thing rolls around, I'm going to pray again and believe again because God is still good. God's still good. I want to pray with shameless audacity. Open up. Open up. All right? It's important that we pray persistently. Band, you can go ahead and come. We can wrap up. I want to pray with shameless audacity. 
You know, the Lord doesn't require us to have a ton of faith. What does he say? He says, the faith the size of a mustard seed is all we need to move a mountain. However, there are many times in the scriptures where he also rebukes the disciples for having too little faith. You ever notice that? He's like, oh, you have little faith. And they're like, well, I thought you said we only needed a little faith. <laughs> it's the size of a mustard seed, you know? Why does that make sense? Well, some of it is you got to remember different language, different culture. And so some of what might be happening is that when the, Jesus refers to faith the size of a mustard seed, he's referring to the amount of faith you have, the size of your faith. I just have a little bit of faith. But then when he says, oh, you have little faith, he doesn't say small faith. He says little faith. Oh, you have little faith. Why did you not believe? Why did you doubt? It's because in that instance, it's very likely that he might be referring to the length of your faith, the amount of time you were able to keep your faith. And so what Jesus is saying is, if you just have a tiny bit of faith for a long time, you can see mountains move. But if you just have a ton of faith for a short amount of time, you won't even move. <laughs> It's a, this is, this is, it, it's not about how much faith you have. It's about how long can you hold it? How long can you keep it? How long can you carry your faith as you knock on the door? How long can you keep believing and keep trusting that what God is doing is for your good and that he's called you to pray and that we pray with persistence in our lives? It's not the amount how long last thing number four is pray biblically pray biblically I'm gonna pray habitually I'm gonna pray strategically I'm gonna pray persistently and number four is pray biblically I, I don't need to spend much time on this because we talked about this so much last week but he gives us another illustration in which he says if your son asks you for a fish who would give him a snake no one if he asked for an egg who would give him a scorpion no one that is weird you would not do that. So then if you, even though you're evil, we're evil, we're sinful, know how to give good gifts to your children, what makes you think your Father in heaven would not be able to give good gifts to those who ask? And so this goes back to that parable. It, the neighbor won't answer the door out of friendship. He will answer the door out of annoyance. Jesus is saying, how much more is the Lord who loves you willing to fling the door wide open? when you pray. The question is, do you have a right view of God? Do you know who you're praying to? Do you understand who God is? Because if you don't know how good He is and how much He loves you and how much He desires for you, you're going to struggle. So how do we do that? How do we have a right view of God? The Word informs our view of God. you got to pray biblically. Pray knowing who the Word says God is. Last story, um, probably told this before, but on the West Coast, a bunch of surfers gathered surfing for the day. One of the surfers brings his little girl, little daughter out onto the water. She's four years old. He's trying to get her used to the water. It's such a big part of their lives. And so he brings her out. He sits her on his board. He's in the water about waist deep. And she's scared. She's crying. She's, uh, you know, and it's, it's just so much. She's scared of the water. She doesn't want to drown. And, and so, you know, he gives it a rest. He brings her in. They give it a break. They have lunch. And one of the other surfers, one of, the, one of their friends comes over and sits down. And he says to the little girl, he says, hey, can I tell you a secret about your dad? And her eyes get all big. She's like, yeah, you know. He's like, listen, your dad is one of the best surfers in the world. She's like, wow. Oh, yeah. And he says, yeah, listen. He's going to take care of you. He won't let anything happen to you out there. So after lunch is over, they go back out, puts her back out on the board, sits her down. And she's laughing, and she's splashing the water, and she's playing around, having the time of her life. And so the question is, okay, well, what changed? Same water, same ocean, same little girl, same surfboard, same dad. What changed? Her father didn't change. 
her perception of her father changed. See, listen, the reality is he was going to keep her safe either way, either time. Only the second time she knew it. She knew it. How would your prayer life change if you knew who the one was in which you're praying to? Come on, stand to your feet this morning. How would it shape our lives? How would it shape our city? How would it shape our nation? How would it shape the nations of the world if the church, if Jesus' body recognized who it is we're praying to? I want, if our, our ministry team will go ahead and get in place, those of you who serve on our ministry team, just prepare to, to, to pray over any needs today that we have. And I just want to make a call this morning that if you don't realize how much Jesus loves you, he loved you to hell and back. He went to hell on your behalf and rose from the grave that you would know the love of a real father. And, and I want to tell you this morning that the penalty that is owed by you, like your death on your cross, that's your wage for your sin, he took it on your behalf. And so if, if you've never realized that Jesus is the father sitting, standing beside the surfboard, and you're this little this little child who is drowning in a sea of life you need to recognize there's a father who knows what he's doing he's just waiting for you to understand it waiting for you to see him rightly so if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus you can do that right now you don't have to say a prayer after me you don't have to come forward you can right now in your life in your heart choose to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ make him your savior and say I'm surrendering my life to you Come on, all over the room, I want you to just bow your heads, close your eyes, I want you to lift your hands. I want you to get in a posture of receiving this morning. And Jesus, we just receive your love and we receive your truth. God, we have heard some hard things this morning, but Jesus, we have heard your word. These are your words in Luke 11. You're the one who desires for your people to pray like you. Jesus, all over this room, I just begin to ask that if there's anyone here who's never given their life to you, that they would do it in this moment, at this time. Surrender fully and completely to you. Jesus, if there's anyone in this room that is deeply in need of a touch from the Lord, they've been praying, they've been praying, they've been banging on that door, they've been persisting. Oh, Jesus, I pray that you would equip them with shameless audacity, that you would give them that backbone in prayer that they so desperately need. Jesus name In Jesus name worship team can y'all just start singing that song for me I want you to be obedient to the Holy Spirit I want you to begin to come up here if you got needs that you need prayer for if you got things in your life you've been contending for come on you got some prayer partners here right now who want to lay hands if you're here and you want to give your life to Jesus and you want to come forward and do that we're here right here to pray with you and to lead you in that okay I want us to worship I want us to spend a few minutes in prayer Thank mm -hmm. you.